This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, visit LibriVox.org. Reading by Mark Nelson, San Jose, California. The Green Odyssey by Philip Jose Farmer. Chapters 19 through 21. Then Aga was blotted out by the dense cloud of dust that billowed out over her and filled the whole room. With it came an intense heat. Green opened his mouth to cry out to Amra and Paxi to cover their faces and especially their noses. Before he could do so, his own open mouth was packed with dust and his nostrils were full. He began sneezing and coughing explosively, while his eyes ran tears in their effort to wash out the dirt that caked and burned them. Clods of dirt struck him, hurled by the blast. They didn't hurt because they were so small and so fluffy, but they fell so swiftly and in such numbers that he was half buried under them. Even in the midst of his shock, he couldn't help being thankful that he'd been breathing out when the heat struck him. Otherwise, he'd have sucked in air that would have seared his lungs, and he'd have dropped dead. As it was, wherever his skin had not been covered by cloth, he felt as if he were suffering a bad case of sunburn. Painfully, he rose on all fours and began crawling toward the other room, where he thought the dust would not be so thick. At the same time, he tugged at Amra's arm, at least he supposed it was her arm, since she'd been so close to him when the explosion took place. His gesture was intended to tell her that she should follow him. She rose and followed him, touching him from time to time. Once she stopped, and he turned to find out what was bothering her. Even if he felt that he couldn't stand much more of the almost solid dust in his lungs and had to get out to open air or strangle. Then he knew that the woman was Amra, for she was carrying a child in her arms. The child had a scarf around her head, and as he remembered, Paxi was the only infant so dressed. Coughing violently, he rose to his feet, pulling Amra to hers, and swiftly walked toward where he hoped the exit was. He knew he'd fallen on his face in the general direction of the doorway. If he kept in a straight line, he might make it without wandering off to one side. He found soon enough that he was going just opposite, for he fell headlong over a body on the floor. When he got up again, he ran his hands over the body. The skin was crusty, scaly. Aga's burned corpse. The cutlass was lying by her side, assuring him of her identity. Reoriented, he turned back, still pulling Amra by the hand. This time he ran into a wall, but he had his free hand stretched out in front of him for just such an event. Frantically, he groped to his left until he came to the corner of the room. Then, knowing that the doorway lay back to his right, he turned and felt along the metal until he came to the opening. He plunged through it, almost fell into the other room, which was as dark and dusty as the one he'd just left. He trotted on ahead, bumped into another wall, groped to his right, found the next exit and ran through that. Here the air was much more free of dust. He could actually make out outlines of his companions as the light was penetrating the fainter haze. Nevertheless, he and the others were coughing and weeping as if they were trying to eject lungs and eyeballs alike. Spasm after spasm shook them. Green decided that this room wasn't really much better than the others, so he led Amra and Paxi around the right-angled corner and into the dark tunnel. Here his violent rackings began to quiet down, and by rapid blinking, which forced tears, he cleaned his eyes of much of the dust. Anxiously, he peered down the passageway towards its end, where the cave mouth formed a dim arch in the moonlight outside. It was as he feared. Somebody stood there, outlined in the beams, bent forward, peering in. He thought that it must be the priestess, for the figure was slight and the hair was pulled up on top of the head in a great psyche knot with a feather stuck through it. Moreover, around her feet were four or five cats. His coughing betrayed him, for the priestess suddenly whirled and trotted off on her stick-like legs. Green dropped Amra's hand and ran at the same time drawing his stiletto from his belt, as he'd lost his cutlass during the explosion. He had to stop the priestess, though he didn't know what good it would do. 
The savages, sooner or later, would come to the sanctuary to ask if she'd seen any of the refugees. And if they couldn't find her, they would at once suspect what had happened. The chances were that they already knew. Surely the noise of the blast must have penetrated even to their ears. Or had it? The airwaves had to round several perpendicular turns before reaching the cave mouth, and it might be that the noise had seemed much greater to Green than it actually was because he'd been so close to it. Perhaps there was some hope. He ran into the clearing before the cave mouth. The sun was just coming over the horizon, so he could see things clearly. The old woman was nowhere in sight. The only live things were several drunken cats. One of these began to rub its back against Green's leg and purred loudly. Automatically he stooped down and caressed it, though his gaze flickered everywhere for a sign of the priestess. The door of her hut was open, and since it was so small he could be certain that she had no room in there to hide from him. She must have run off down the path. If so, she wasn't making any noise about it. There were no outcries from her to call her companions to her help. He found her lying face down on the path, halfway down the hill. At first he thought she was playing possum, so he turned her over, his stiletto ready to shut off any outcry. A glance at her hanging jaw and ashen color convinced him that her possum-playing days were over. At first he thought she'd tripped and broken her neck, but an examination disproved this. The only thing he could think of was that her old heart had given away under the sudden fright and the stress of running. Something brushed his ankles. So startled was he, so convinced that a spear had just missed him, he leaped into the air and whirled around. Then he saw that it was only the cat that had rubbed against him when he'd first come out of the tunnel. It was a large female cat with a beautiful long black silky coat and with golden eyes. It exactly resembled the earth cat and was probably descended from the same ancestors as its terrestrial counterpart. Wherever Homo sapiens of the unthinkably long ago had penetrated, he seemed to have taken his canine and feline pets. "'You like me, huh?' said Green. "'Well, I like you, too, but I'm not going to if you keep on scaring me. I've been through enough tonight for a lifetime.' The cat, purring, paced delicately toward him. "'Maybe you can do me some good,' he said, and lifted the cat to his shoulder, where he crouched, vibrating with contentment. "'I don't know what you see in me,' he confided softly to her. "'I must be a frightful-looking object, what with being covered with dust, and my eyes red and raw and running. But then you're not so delightful yourself, what with your beery breath blowing in my face. I like you very much, what's your name? What is your name?' Let's call you Lady Luck. After all, when I rubbed you, I found the priestess dead. If she hadn't died, she'd have run away to warn the cannibals. And obviously, you, her luck, had deserted her for me. So Lady Luck it will be. Let's go back up the hill and see what's happened to the rest of my friends. He found Amra sitting down at the cave's mouth, cuddling Paxi in an effort to quiet her. Nine others were there, too. Grisqueter, Soon, Miran, Inzax, three women, two little girls. The rest, he presumed, were lying dead or unconscious in the altar room. They made a dirty-looking, red-eyed, weary group, not good for much except lying down and passing out. Look, he said, we have to get some sleep, whatever else happens. We'll go back into the first chamber and get some there. And, as one, the others protested that nothing would get them to return anywhere near that horrible, fiend-haunted room. Green was at a loss. He thought he knew exactly what had happened, but he just could not explain to these people in terms they'd understand. And they probably would have a dark distrust of him from then on. He decided to take the simple, if untrue, explanation. Undoubtedly, Aga provoked a host of demons by striking at that wall behind the altar, he said. I tried to warn her. You all heard me. But those demons won't bother us again, for we are now under the protection of the cat, the cannibal's totem. Moreover, it is the nature of such beings that, once they've released their fury and have taken some victims, they are harmless, quiescent, for a long time after. It takes time for them to build up strength enough to hurt human beings again. 
They swallowed this offering as they never would have his other explanation. If you will lead the way, they said, we will return. We put our lives in your hands. Before going into the cave, he paused to take another survey. From his spot in the clearing, which was almost on the top of the hill, he could look out over the treetops and see most of the island, except where other hills barred his view. The island had stopped moving, and had settled down against the plain itself. Now, to the untutored eye, the entire mass looked like a clump of dirt, rocks, and vegetation, for some reason rising in the grassy seas. It would remain so until dusk, when it would again launch itself upon its five-mile-an-hour journey to the east. And once, having reached a certain point there, it would reverse itself and begin its nocturnal pilgrimage toward the west. Back and forth, shuttling for how many thousands of years? What was its purpose, and whom had its builders been? Surely they could not have conceived in their wildest dreams of its present use a mobile fortress for a tribe of cannibals, nor could they have seen to what uses their dust collectors would be put. They couldn't have guessed that, millennia thence, men, ignorant of their originally intended purpose, would be using the devices as part of their religious ritual and of human sacrifice. Green left the others in the room next to the one where the explosion had taken place. They lay down on the hard floor and at once went to sleep. He, however, felt that there were certain things that had to be done, and that he was the only one physically capable of doing them. Though he hated to go back into the altar room, he forced himself. The scene of carnage was bad enough, but not as repulsive as he'd expected. Dust had thrown a gray veil of mercy over the bodies. They looked like peaceful gray statues. Most of them had not burned on the outside, but had died because they'd breathed the first lung-scorching wave of air directly. Nevertheless, despite the look of peace and antiquity, the odor of burned flesh from Aga hung heavy. Lady Luck bristled and arched her back, and for a moment Green thought she was going to leap from his shoulder and run away. He said, Take it easy, then decided that she must have smelled this often before. Her present reaction was based on past episodes. Probably there had been great excitement then. The cats, being taboo animals, must have been figures of some importance in the sacrificial ceremonies. Cautiously, the man approached the wall of dirt behind the altar, even though he did not think there would be any danger for some time to come. The altar itself was comparatively undamaged. Surprised at this, he ran his hand over it and found out that it was composed of baked clay, hard as rock. The chair and metal rod had not been torn loose. Both were tightly bolted down with huge studs, which he supposed had been taken off wrecked rollers. The victims that were tied in the chair by the savages must have been sitting looking at the audience, so that their backs were to the wall itself. That meant that when the rod was dropped to make contact between the wall and the victim, the discharge only burned the sacrifice's head. Evidence of that was the fact that only skulls were stacked around the altar. The charred head was severed and the body carted outside to one destination or another. What puzzled Green was how the audience managed to escape the fury of the blast and of the dust, even if they stood at the farthest end of the room. Determined to find out what happened at those times, he returned to the doorway. Just around its corner, in the second room, he discovered what he'd not noticed before, probably because it was placed so upright and so firmly against one side of the wall, and because its back, which was turned away from the wall, was also made of gray metal. When he switched it around so he could see its other side, he was staring into a mirror about six feet high and four feet wide. Now he could visualize the ceremony. The victim was strapped into the chair and a rope was tied around the rod. Everybody but the priestess, or whoever conducted the rites, retreated from the altar room. The conductor himself, or herself, then stood in the doorway and released the cord. Before the rod could make contact, the conductor had stepped around the corner. And there the audience saw in the mirror, placed in the doorway so it reflected the interior of the altar room,
the ravening discharge of a tremendous electrostatic blast. And immediately afterward, no doubt, they saw nothing because of the dust that would fill the two rooms. Strange and strong magic to the savages. What myths they must have built around this room, what tales of horrible and powerful gods or demons imprisoned in that wall of dirt. Surely their old women must whisper to the wide-eyed children stories of how the great cat-spirit had been caught by their legendary strongman and savior, some analogue to Hercules or Gilgamesh or Thor, and how the cat-spirit was the tribes to keep prisoner with their magic and to appease from time to time with human kills from other tribes, lest it become so angry it burst through the wall of earth and devour everybody upon the floating island. Green knew that it was hopeless to try to dig through that wall, even if it would be safe for days. It might only be several feet thick, or it might be twenty or more. But however thick it was, he bet that anybody who had the tools, time, and strength to excavate would find, embedded somewhere in that mass, several large dust collectors. He didn't know what shape they'd take, because that would depend on the culture that had built them, and their tastes and decorations would differ from Green's multi-millennia later society. But if they had architectural ideas similar to present-day Terrans, they would have constructed the collectors in the shape of busts, or of animals' heads, or even of bookcases with false backs of books filling them, books that would in reality have been both chargers and filters. The busts, or books, would have been pierced with so many tiny holes, and through these holes the charged particles of dust would have drifted. Once inside the collectors, they would have been burned. Looking at the blank dirt before him, Green could see what had happened through the ages. Some part of the burning mechanism had gone wrong, as was the custom of mechanisms everywhere. But the charging effect had continued, and though the dust had piled up around the collectors, the extraordinarily powerful fields had continued to work even through the thick blanket. In the beginning, of course, their field could not have caused any human being harm. But these batteries must have been built to adjust to whatever demand was made of them, though their builders, of course, could have had no idea of how great that demand would some day be. Nevertheless, it had come, and the batteries had been equal to it. By the time the savages had found this room, they were blocked off by this imposing wall. Through the death of their fellows, they had discovered that touching the wall caused a terrible discharge of electrostatic electricity. The rest of the apparatus for execution and the ritual that went with it was foregone and logical, religiously speaking. Green swore with frustration. How he would love to get through that dirt before another charge built up. On the other side must be another doorway, and it must lead to the fuel and control rooms for this whole island. If he could get inside and there figure out the controls, he'd turn this island upside down and shake off the man-eating monsters. There'd be no holding him then. He remembered the story of Sam Drew, the tailor who turned sailor. The legend went that Sam Drew, his roller wrecked upon just such a roaming island as this one, had wandered into just such a cave and through rooms like these. But he'd found no barrier of electrically charged dirt and had walked into a room which contained many strange things. One of them was a great eye that allowed Sam Drew to see in it what was happening outside the cave. Another was a board which contained many round faces over which raced little squiggles and lines. Of course, the story had its own explanations for what these things were, but Green could hardly fail to recognize TV, oscilloscopes, and other instruments. Unfortunately, his knowledge was going to do him no good. He wasn't going to get through that dirt. Nor was he to be allowed time for excavation and exploration. Every minute on this island meant that he was traveling back to Quatz and its revengeful Duchess and getting farther from Astoria, where the two spacemen and their ship were. He had to find a way of getting off this place and onto some means of transportation. He left the death chamber and went into the next room. After slumping down against the wall, between Amra with Paxi in her arms and Inzax with Grizz Quetter in hers, he chewed some dried meat. 
Lady Luck meowed for some, and he gladly gave her all she wanted. When he'd swallowed all he could hold without bursting, and had washed that down with great draughts of the warm and sweet beer taken from the priestess's hut, he closed his eyes. Now it was up to his vigilante to take the food and rebuild his wasted tissue, throw off the effects of the auto-intoxication, tone his tired muscles, relax his too taut nerves, readjust his hormonal balance. Green dreamed that his mouth and nose were clogged with dirt and that he was suffocating. He woke to find that, while there was no earth upon him, he was having a difficult time getting his breath. Remedying that by removing the cat from his face, he rose. "'What do you want?' he asked her. She was mewing and striking gently at him. She padded toward the doorway to the outside, so he imagined that she wished him to follow him. Grasping his cutlass, he walked after her and out to the tunnel that led to the cave mouth. Not until then did he hear the booming of cannon, far away. The cat meowed plaintively. Evidently, she'd heard cannon fire before and had not liked the results. Once out of the cave, he stopped to look up at the sun. It was on its downward path from the zenith, about four o'clock in the afternoon. He'd slept about ten hours. Unable to see much from where he stood, he climbed up the rocks outside the cave, and soon stood upon the very top of the hill, a little tableland about ten feet square. From there he commanded as good a view of the island as anyone could get. Tacking around the periphery of the island were three long, low, black-hulled rollers with over-large wheels and scarlet sails. Occasionally a lance of red spurted from one of the vessel's ports. A boom reached Green's ears a few seconds later, and he would see the iron ball climb up and up, then fall toward the village. A tree around the clearing would lose a limb, or a spurt of dust would show where a ball landed in the clearing itself. Two of the longhouses had big holes in their roofs. The village itself was deserted, as no one with good sense would have remained there. None of the cannibals were visible, but that wasn't surprising, considering how thick the woods were. Green hoped the Vings would land soon and clean out the savages. That would leave him and his party a clear field unless the pirates investigated the cave in the same day. If they didn't, then the refugees could leave the island and take to the plains under cover of the night. Anxiously, Green traced the path that led from the hilltop where he stood and wound down to the village. It was a narrow trail and he often lost sight of it, but always there was a difference in the shading of the treetops along the trail and the rest of the forest. With his eye he could follow the shading to the village and beyond toward the back or western part of the island. It was here that he came across the first sign of hope he had had since the wreck of the Bird of Fortune. It was a small break in the vegetation which ran uninterrupted to the very edge of the island, a shelf of seemingly smooth earth, almost hidden from him by the slope of the terrain. Indeed, he could barely make it out and might have missed it altogether but he saw the masts of three small rollers projecting from above the slope and followed them down toward the hulls. All three were yachts, obviously not of islander make. Beyond the stolen craft were the uprights of davits. These were behind a wall of branches, camouflage for anybody outside the island, but visible to those on the inside. It was all Green could do to keep from whooping with joy. Now he and his party wouldn't have to cast themselves on foot on the dangerous plains. They could sail in comparative safety. Now, while the cannibals were cowering helplessly under the bombardment, Green could lead his people through the woods to the yachts. When dusk came and the island began moving again, they could lower a yacht from the davits and set sail. He went back to the cave entrance, where he found everybody awake, waiting for him. He told them what he'd seen and added, if the Vings come aboard, we'll take advantage of the confusion and escape. Moran looked at the sun and shook his head. The Vings won't attack now. It's too close to dusk. They'll want a full day for fighting. They'll follow the island tonight. When dawn comes and the island stops, they'll board. 
I bow to your superior experience, Green said. Only I'd like to ask you one thing. Why don't the Vings launch their small craft at night and land boarding parties from them? Moran looked surprised. No one does that. It's unthinkable. Don't you know that at night the planes abound in spirits and demons? The Vings wouldn't think of taking a chance on what the magic of the savages might unloose against them in the darkness. I knew of the general attitude, but it had slipped my mind, admitted Green. But if this is so, why did you all wander about this place the night the bird was wrecked? That was a situation where we preferred the somewhat uncertain possibility of stumbling across demons to the certainty of being killed by the cannibals, said Moran. To be honest, said Amra, I was too scared to think of ghosts. If I had, I might have stayed where I was. No, I wouldn't either. I've never seen a ghost, but I had seen those savages. Well, said Green, all of you might as well make up your mind that, come ghosts, demons, or men, we're walking through the dark tonight. All those too scared will have to stay behind. He began issuing orders, and in a short time he had the sleepy-eyed, bedraggled, and dirty-looking party ready. After that, he turned to watch the bombardment. By then it had largely ceased. Only occasionally did one of the vessels loose a single cannon shot. The rest of the time they spent in tacking back and forth, and in running up close to the very edge of the island. I think they are trying the temper of the island's inhabitants, Green said. They don't know whether the woods conceal a hundred savages or a thousand, or whether they're armed with cannons and musket or just with spears. They want to draw fire so they can get an estimate of what they're facing. He turned to Moran. Which reminds me, why is it that the natives don't use guns? They must have had a chance to get their hands on many from the wrecks. The fat merchant shrugged and rolled his one good eye to indicate that he didn't really know, but was making a guess. Probably they've a taboo against using firearms. Whatever the reason, they're evidently suffering because they neglect them. Look how few they are. Only fifty men. They must have lost quite a few through raids from other savage tribes both from those who live upon the plain itself and from those who live on the other roaming islands. They're down to the point now where they must die out within a generation, even without help from such as those, he said, pointing to the Ving rollers. Yes, and I suppose that during the daytime, when the island is stopped, grass cats and dire dogs board it. These must take their toll of the humans. He gazed again at the red sails and wheels of the Vings. I'd think that those pirates would take every island they could and would use them as bases from which to operate. They do, said Amra. For a generation now, the Vinks have been scouring the plains, locating the islands, and exterminating the savages on them. Then they fortified the islands, so that you might say that today the Exertimer is dominated by them. But there's a drawback to an island as a harbor. No large roller may get very close, except in the daylight. They have to put out to grass every night and follow their base at a safe distance until dawn. However, though the Vings are well established on many roamers, they're often attacked by navies of various nations and sometimes driven off. Then the nation that takes possession of the island has a nice little base. And, of course, quite often they use it to launch their own piratical ventures against the craft of countries at peace with them. Oh, the Exertimer is a land where every man's hand is against the other and the devil take the ones with short sail. A man may make his fortune or break his heart, all in a night's work, but then you know that only too well. Green interrupted. We'll leave them and the natives too when the moonlight gets here. I only hope that there aren't other Ving craft in the neighborhood. What the gods will happens, replied Moran. His sad face projected the belief that if he, the favorite of Menorox, could come to grief, then Green could expect even worse. When dusk came, Green walked from the cave into the dark and hard rain. Behind him came Amra, one hand upon his shoulder, the other supporting Paxi. The rest were stretched out in a line behind her, each person's hand on the shoulder of the one ahead. The black cat was underneath Green's coat, riding in a large pocket of his shirt. She had made it plain to him that where he went, she went and Green, to avoid a big fuss, 
and also because he was beginning to feel very affectionate toward her, allowed her to come along. The descent from the hilltop was an anxious and stumbling trip. Green, after ten minutes of groping along the path, had to acknowledge he did not know where he was. So many windings had the path taken that he did not know whether he was going east, north, south, or in the right direction, west. Actually, it didn't matter as long as it brought him to the edge of the island. He could skirt the edge until he arrived at the fleet craft that would give them a chance for flight. The trouble was in finding that rim. He was afraid that it would be possible to wander in circles and figure eights until moonlight. Then, though they'd be able to orient themselves, they'd also be exposed to the view of the cannibals. And if they found themselves, say, at the eastern edge, their journey around would be perilous indeed. Occasional lightning flashed, and then he could make out his immediate environment. These brief revelations weren't much help. All he could see were the solid-seeming walls of tree trunks and bushes. Suddenly Amra spoke. Do you think we're getting close? He stopped so suddenly that the entire line lurched into him. Lightning burst again, quite close by. The cat, curled in his coat pocket, spat and tried to shrink into an even smaller ball. Absently, Green patted her from outside the coat. He said, Your name is Lady Luck. I just saw the village. Now we're getting someplace. I really needed that referent. He wasn't worried about the inhabitants of the village. All were undoubtedly cowering under the roofs of their longhouses, praying to whatever gods they worshipped that they would not send the lightning their way. There would be little danger if the whole party were to walk through the center of the village. He planned to take no chances at all, however, and ordered everybody to follow him around the clearing. It won't be long now, he said to Amra. Pass the word back and cheer everybody up. Half an hour later, he wished he'd kept his mouth shut. It was true that he'd followed the wandering path to the cove where the boats were kept, but he'd at once drawn his breath in pain of surprise. A lightning bolt had illuminated the gray rock walls of the cove, its broad shelf, and the high black iron davits. But the yachts were gone. End of chapters 19 through 21